that voice. You decided to visit us today? Who, me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm back. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> You've been gone forever. I know, that's true. That's true. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm just jumping right back into it. No, and jump in. I was thankful to see that, Jonathan, you were on our schedule today because... What a great way to come back to the team and have a conversation about God alone. And I will tell you who Jonathan is, but first let me say good morning to you. Good morning. Great to be with you. Thanks for the invitation, Dawn and Steve. Wonderful to be back. It, you hear this voice of Jonathan Griffiths on the radio program Encounter the Truth, and I know some of our Moody Radio stations are carrying that. You're also a lead pastor there in Ottawa, Canada, the Metropolitan Bible Church. <laughs> I chuckled. I know you and Steve, you have a friendship and you work together in another project, which is Encounter the Truth, but I got so tickled this morning looking at your bio. I don't I think I remember this when we spoke last year, but um, you've studied at not only Oxford, but you have your Ph.D. from Cambridge. I'm out. <laughs> oh, you can hang with us. I, I don't You'll know. Right. I don't You're good. Know. You're good. Well, let, let's just talk about what I do love to talk about, and that is who our God is. I often do think, Jonathan, that because of our small view of God, our understanding that is lacking, it is more difficult to follow him when we don't think about who he is, his attributes, and how we can know him better, and it changes us. So the heart behind the book, God Alone, is to help us dig deeper into the things that we can know. Yes? Well, that, well that's exactly right. I think I, I was just so aware for myself and for our church family here that so many of our problems really in the Christian life Um, stem from the fact that we don't know God as well as we could and really as well as we should because he's made himself known in his word and often when we face you know our practical difficulties in discipleship you know we a a marriage challenge or financial challenge or a a parenting whatever it is we we look for the quick solution we sort of treat symptoms and I just came to the conviction that we need to look at the root cause which is our understanding of, of of God and his greatness and his power and his and his majesty. And so that was what got me going down the road of this study, which has been just really fruitful for me personally and 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 for our church family. It's been a fruitful thing to dig into. And uh, so, so glad that the book has has come to fruition eventually. You have a line in the even in the introduction of the book that uh, I thought addressed that real well. You said uh, our constant danger is that we have this view of God that is too small and domesticated one form from personal opinion and cultural assumption rather than from the teaching of the scriptures. And so as a pastor and you look at your congregation, as you look at Christendom and the evangelical world as a whole, um, how do you see us choosing to define God right now? Is it, are we kind of just kind of picking and choosing and deciding this is how I want God to be? Well, I think there are a couple of different ways we see this happen. I mean, I, I think it does happen as we engage in conversations with those who don't yet know the Lord and we want to be sharing about our faith. And, you know, you, you have these conversations with someone who's not a believer and perhaps they have an idea of God and an openness. And they say, well, I like to think of God as being like dot, dot, dot. You know how that conversation mm-hmm. goes. And, you know, generally you're in some trouble when it starts going down that line, because what's actually going on is we're sort of forming God in in our own image, or we're creating a God who will be convenient to us and who we think will meet our needs, but it's not the God who has made himself known in the Bible. And and so there's some real work to be done there to try and introduce someone to God as he's made himself known in, in scripture. But even for us who know the Lord Jesus by faith and who walk with him, I think our our vision of who God is can be skewed because we haven't looked closely enough at the word or our view of him is diminished because our faith still needs to grow. And we see that in some practical ways where, you know, we we might say, and this is one of the chapters in the book, you know, we might say, hey, I believe that God is omnipotent. He is all powerful. That's that's I believe that. But then we hit a situation which seems completely overwhelming and we you know, we're, we're, we're in the midst of something which is terrifying, perhaps. Uh, which threatens to just just swamp us. And at that moment, we ask the question, do I believe God is powerful enough for this? And I have to think about it because my my understanding of God's omnipotence actually is not is not big enough yet. And it needs to grow by faith. 
Well, I think throughout the uh, hour here, our conversation is going to get us into some of those characteristics, some of those attributes of God. But uh, we're, we're probably going to focus on what are called the incommunicable ones rather than the communicable ones. And and so just to make sure that we're all on the same page here as we have this conversation, Jonathan, in your book, you've kind of focused on those incommunicable tr- uh, characteristics and attributes of God. Let's define our terms here. What does that mean? Incommunicable attributes of God. What is that? Yeah. Theologians have, have, have helped us by dividing the attributes of God that we see in scripture into these two categories, communicable and incommunicable. And the, the communicable ones are ones that God shares with us as we come to know him and he changes us by the spirit. And the incommunicable ones are ones that are unique to him. And uh, we glory in them, we wonder at them, but we don't share them in that sense. And I guess we'll talk a little bit more about what those are. Well, we're going to come back in just a few minutes and continue to unpack that as we talk with Jonathan Griffiths about his book, God Alone, lead pastor at the Metropolitan Bible Church in Ottawa, Canada. He's uh, studied theology at the University of Oxford, PhD from Cambridge. He's the Bible teacher on Encounter the Truth. He serves on the Council of the Gospel Coalition Canada, founder and executive director of the Timothy Trust, and has written the book, God Alone, His Unique Attributes and How Knowing Them Changes Us. And Jonathan, one of the things that uh, I know to be uh, true of you is that you have an appreciation for Puritan writers. And it seems like when you go back and you read the Puritans, that was something that was a part of their writing, maybe even a part of the, the church culture of the day, Knowing who God was, looking at his attributes and his characteristics, it seems as if uh, the church has kind of gotten away from that. What is the danger of not looking at the characteristics and the attributes of God? Yeah, I think that's a great observation, Steve. I think that's that's right historically. You know, as I was doing some reading around and trying to do a little bit of research for this project, I did find more and more. I, I had to dig back into the Puritans because you know, between their period and ours, there had been a lot less reflection on the attributes of God than you might have thought. And that was was kind of striking for me. But I think it is a danger. I think uh, we get into trouble when we don't give deep thought to who God is and what he's like. And I think it is perhaps a symptom of our age. You know, we're real, we're wonderful consumers, aren't we? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, the, the American consumer is, 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 is wonderfully reliable as a consumer and the Canadian consumer similarly, and we are interested in our needs being met and we look for quick fixes to our problems. And as we do that as Christian people, you know, if we fall into that danger, we are thinking really in, in practical terms about what's going to help me and move me forward in my discipleship, but we don't give deep thought to who God is in and of himself. But the Bible does give deep thought to who God is. And what we find is that when we when we study him and get to know him and know him more deeply, then things begin to fall into place in the Christian life. But secondarily, as we know God, uh, and, and I think it's so important to go back to those foundational questions. Jonathan, if we know God and we know his attributes and we start to think on those things, it could mess up our Christianity. It could. I think it could make us a lot less me focused. I think it could uh, reshape our thinking to be centered on him and on his glory. We could be consumed a lot more in our thoughts about him and a lot less consumed in our thoughts about us and our needs and our problems and our reputation and our image and these kinds of things. So there is a real reshaping that happens when we ground ourselves properly in thinking about God and delighting in God, which is which is the great hope and prayer behind this book. Well, I want to uh, begin to take a look at some of those characteristics, some of those attributes of God, and we're certainly not going to be able to touch all of those that you address in the book, God Alone. But one of the things that you're right out of the gate with is the fact that we have an eternal God. And I, I have a hard time wrapping my, uh, my brain around this. I mean, I can almost fathom God in eternity going forward, but God in eternity going backwards, <laughs> like my brain, can't, like everything has a beginning, everything, everything, but, but God doesn't. Why is it so significant, you think, for us to understand the eternality of God? 
Yeah, well, Steve, I mean, I think you're right in saying it's really tough thing for us to wrap our minds around, you know, we're finite creatures, and we're we're already into territory in the conversation where it's it's beyond our reckoning to some extent. And we, we just need to make our peace with that a little bit. That's that's going to be the case. And it, I guess, as we think about about, you know, a, a divine being about the God of the universe, it's not a surprise logically and rationally speaking that our our thinking should be stretched by that so that's 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 not a surprise but when we say that god is eternal what we're really saying is that he is uh, unrestrained and unconstrained with respect to time it's it's not simply that he goes you know back in the line of time and forward in the line of time without an end it is that he he stands outside time and we recognize that god is actually the creator of time and since he made it, he is not bound by it in the sense that you and I are, are bound by time. So he's, he can stand back from time and look at time as a whole. He sees the whole spectrum of, of, of time, which he has created, and he can observe it. And that's that's not something that you and I can do. But because he is God, well, he can. Mm-hmm. He can. And he that is why Romans 828 <laughs> works, because he is a God that can stand back kind of figuratively to our human minds. And he is the author of it all. Oh, why does it matter that we know about his attributes? Jonathan Griffiths is sharing that with us, not only in our conversation this morning, but in the brand new book called God Alone. God's unique attributes and how knowing them changes us. And Jonathan, we've talked a little bit about how God is eternal, but the unchanging component of who God is, how does that impact us, especially in a me-centric society, when we are asking the Lord, okay, I get it. I'm all about myself. I'm realizing that. I want to be more about you. How does the fact that he's unchanging help us when we are going through so many difficult things here on planet earth yeah i think it i think it's something that does impact us very profoundly it it challenges us and i think it comforts us who know him and who trust him so i think on the on the challenging side look if god is unchanging it means his standards don't change uh his his expectations for his people don't change uh, change and you know we, we're we're in a cultural context where everything is changing all the time the foundations are crumbling and you, you know as we observe all that we're disconcerted and we're going to talk about the comfort piece in a second but I think also for us the challenge is that we might think well well maybe actually the culture's right and 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 you know maybe God's not so uptight about this particular issue where 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 we thought he was and well may you know maybe we need to just revisit that understanding of of God's expectation for for human beings and for his people in 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 this moral arena and if God is unchanging we need to recognize the fact that his his standards aren't subject to revision as the culture changes and that's that's pretty sobering for us I think that's a wake-up call for us uh I, I I think I think you know sometimes I wonder if if you know the saints of old you know if we went back a hundred years and met with some 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 wonderful believers some saints of old and and they just examined our churches in our lives and looked at us i wonder what they would think sometimes and we we you know we just imagine that standards have evolved but but the thing is god's unchanging so i think that's sobering but it's also very very comforting because it means that when he makes promises to us and makes commitments to us when he makes covenants with us when he makes a covenant with us in christ the new covenant you know these things are not are, are not changeable they're entirely reliable because god doesn't wake up one morning and say actually i changed my mind you know as we human beings can do so easily he's not subject to change like that and what a reassurance that is for us Hmm. Uh, it's uh, so true. And so those promises that he has given us, we can, in a sense, take those to the bank. Um, one of the, the things when I, I think about the attributes of God and the characteristics and qualities of God, there are these omni words that come to mind. And uh, sometimes we, we think of God as, you know, having all these uh, characteristics and, and attributes that we're like, okay, I can kind of wrap my mind around some of these things. Some of those omnis uh, are a little bit tougher for me. And one of those is the fact that God is omnipresent. Mm. You know, it, it helps us understand why is it so significant to understand the omnipresence of God? 
Yeah, that is an interesting one to try and think about spatially, right? That God yeah. is unrestrained with respect to space. You know, we thought with with eternality, we thought about the fact that God is unrestrained with respect to time. Well, here it is with with space and the idea that God is not limited in any way spatially. Um, I I don't think we can fully compute that, but nonetheless, we can we can cling to it and we can affirm that it's true. And again, you know, with with all these at, attributes, actually, there is an element of humbling for us. There is a sobering aspect to it, and then a great encouragement for those who who know God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so, in in terms of sobering us, you know, if we want to run away from the Lord, if we want to if 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 we want to act in secret, you know, he's ev- he's everywhere. There's nowhere yeah. we can go that he is not. And even as believers, sometimes I think we can try and run a little bit. And, you know, you think of Jonah, right? He right. thought he was going to run from his assignment and that wasn't going to work out well for him because God is omnipresent. He's even in the, you know, in the depths of the sea. Um, and so, so, so that's sobering. We're not going to get away from the Lord if we think we can defy him and run. But at the same time, um, there's nowhere we can go that he is not, and he doesn't abandon us. And I think we're, we're living in a loneliness epidemic at the present time. And I was reading a thing this morning, actually, in our in our local paper here in in Ottawa, about the number of seniors who are now living without any family nearby at all, and they're utterly isolated. And that's an increasing phenomenon in our community. And it's true for believers too. We've got many believers in our churches who who are are struggling with loneliness. And what a you know that's something obviously we need to address as the family of God. But what a reassurance it is in seasons of loneliness that God is with me and I, I cannot go anywhere where he is not. That's a very wonderful truth. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it is a fantastic truth. And some of these truths, characteristics, attributes of God, if we're not thinking about those, reflecting on those, our, our lives are not going to be what they're, they're called to be. And uh, so often, as you've said, Jonathan, we can put our eyes on ourselves and not on God. And then we're missing out on the depth of relationship that we could have with him. Well, we're going to continue. Jonathan, you talk about the fact that we need to look at the eternal attributes of God. And as we understand his attributes, how does that change us? Well, I think it, it kind of does two things all the way through in each attribute we look at. It, 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 in a way, it humbles us and brings us down to size as we see how great and magnificent God is and how much bigger he is than us and how much higher are his thoughts than our, our thoughts. It's a humbling thing. And I, I, I think it rightly kind of cuts us down to size. And we need that because we, we, can, we can grow in pride pretty easily, all too easily. So, so it does that all the time. But for us who know him, who trust him, it, um, coming to understand more deeply who he is, it increases our faith all the time. And it equips us to trust him for whatever lies ahead because we see that he is more than able, he is more than big enough to deal with whatever may come along in our experience, our lives, our discipleship, whatever he may call us to do. So I think it's doing both those things all the time as we study his attributes, and 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 it does us such profound good, how we need this. Mm, how we need this. That That is a really, really accurate statement, Jonathan. One of the things that you look at when you're looking at his attributes is the glorious God. I don't know that we consider that very often. What makes him glorious? How does this attribute apply to us on a a given day? Well, you know, the Bible presents um, the Lord God himself as being the great jewel at the center of the universe, really. He is he is he is um, supremely beautiful and supremely wonderful. And the only word we actually can come up with is the word the Bible gives us. He is supremely glorious. You know, he is worthy of all praise and all adoration. And our lives are designed, human life is designed to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's the chief end of, of, of humanity, according to the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And it, it it's put so well, and, and it's absolutely right. But, you know, we are tempted around ourselves and our own feeble uh, puny glory and you know I I think in the kind of Instagram age uh, the temptation to do that is all the more you know we want to present an image of ourselves a very sort of varnished image of ourselves to the world and, and gain attention around that that's just how we're wired 
And the Bible reshapes our thinking and says, no, God is at the center of attention. God is worthy of of worship and adoration and service and praise. And as the Bible increases our vision of how very wonderful and beautiful God is, the Bible then draws us to worship him, to respond to him, to trust him, to serve him. It puts everything back in appropriate perspective. But we are so tempted and so drawn to make things about ourselves and to put the attention there. And it's ultimately, it's just soul destroying to do that. Yeah. Well, we've got time for uh, maybe one more attribute of God. And uh, one of the ones I want to touch on here was just the incomprehensible God. I think there's something in some of us where we want everything to make sense. We, we want to be able to figure things out. And uh, especially if we're kind of wired with that logical brain, I'm like, well, I, I want to know why God is this way. But h- how can we maybe learn to rest in the fact that God is incomprehensible? Yeah, I think that desire that, that you speak of, Steve, is, is there in the unbeliever and it continues in the believer. You know, I, I, I from time to time have these questions with folk who maybe visit our church or who I meet in other contexts who are not yet um, committed to Christ, not yet believers, but are, are considering things. And, and oftentimes they'll have a sort of list of questions basically and say, look, I'm interested in Jesus. I may be considering some other religions, possibly. I've got a list of questions. And, and essentially, however it's framed, essentially what they're saying is this, if Jesus gives me satisfactory answers to all my questions, I might then commit to him in some way. That, that's basically the dynamic there. Yeah. And, and the challenge with that is that God has not promised to tell us everything that we might want to know. And as believers as well, you know, if we love to study the word and so on, we want answers, we want answers, we want answers. But the Bible is is really clear with us, frank with us, that God is not committed to tell us everything about himself. We can know him truly through his word, but we don't know him exhaustively. And the Bible verse that I, I return to on this again and again and again is Deuteronomy 29, 29, which tells us that the secret things belong to the Lord our God but the revealed things belong to us and to our children forever, that we may obey all the words of this law. And the thing there is the things God has told us in his word about himself. He has told us not to satisfy our intellectual curiosity, not for intellectual satisfaction, but so that we might respond to him appropriately in obedience. That's very Mm -hmm. humbling, but it's helpful too. It's very humbling. I hope that is where we find ourselves this morning is thinking about the humility that we need to come before a holy God and how he gives us even so much more than what we deserve because of the relationship we can have and the forgiveness of sin, the relationship we can have with him. Oh, to dig in deeper, I hope that you will enjoy the book, Jonathan Griffith's God alone, his unique attributes and how knowing them changes us. Chris, thank you, brother Jim. Thank you for your text this morning, just looking at who God is and how he changes us. Our conversation with Jonathan Griffith, such a blessing this morning. Music now from Cutlass, everything I need. And of course, you know, we've connected you to this book on our Facebook page, Don and Steve in the Morning.